pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Steve Lecht. Steve is a native of Riverside County, Riverside City. Yes. He's been interested and involved in the local history of Riverside County for more than 35 years. He's written books on various topics related to Riverside County history, including Along the Old Roads, a history of the portion of Southern California that became Riverside County. So we have a real expert here tonight with us. He co-authors the weekly Back in the Day column for the Press Enterprise newspaper in which he explores many aspects of local history throughout western Riverside County. He's currently the president of the Riverside Historical Society and he's a member of the Riverside County Historical Commission. Does it get any better? I don't think so. And tonight he's going to talk to us about the resorts of Riverside County, hot springs, hotels, and health resorts. So take it away, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, as Audrey said, um, here we're going to talk about the various uh, resorts here within the county. Um, I started collecting uh, stuff on Riverside County many years ago. I've got about 5,700 or so vintage postcards throughout the county. And that's what you're going to be seeing tonight here. Uh, when I did one book on Riverside, they asked me to do another one, and so I pulled out all the things that I could on the various resorts. You've got to understand here, Riverside County was very much part of the resort movement in the later 1800s and 1900s. We had all kinds of different places uh, there, and so as people were coming out here either for health, climate, recreation, what have you, we were very much a part of that. Um, so what exactly are we meaning when we say uh, resorts? Well, there's three different types here. There are the hotels. And at this time, there are a number of people who are coming out here to winter. Uh, then the snowbirds we call today. Back then, they were uh, coming out here to winter. Uh, nowadays, they drive RVs. Back then, they came out to various large-scale hotels and spent the winter out here. We also have sanitariums there because uh, this climate was thought to be very helpful for many people, especially people with lung problems. Uh, in an era when TB and asthma and bronchitis and the like were, were rampant and it, it, before antibiotics when the doctor could simply tell you just move west move to an arid climate uh, that, that was about it the other one of course are the uh, springs both hot springs and cold springs uh, that brought people here because of the uh, the health improvements that they thought were coming from these so just to give you a slight background here most of our hot springs, most of the hotels and, and sanitariums are scattered throughout the county. The hot springs, of course, are listed, generally speaking, on our many faults. We've got three different fault systems here. The Elsinore Fault here on the far left with uh, Glen Ivy, Elsinore, and Marietta Hot Springs. The San Jacinto Fault here in the center with Eden, Gilman, and Saboba. And then the San Andreas Fault System here, of course, is Desert Hot Springs. Island Springs, and then Palm Springs in here. Yeah. So you notice these things are right along these, um, these fault lines. That's where you get the hot and or cold springs there. So let's just start in going uh, basically west to east, as you would read. Uh, here in Riverside, probably the, the biggest and one of the best known ones, of course, is the Mission Inn, uh, which started uh, just as a small hotel, uh, Adobe Hotel that uh, Frank Miller decided when Riverside needed its grand hotel, he would build it, and he did it, and basically made it look like a mission because that's what was popular at the time. And he didn't care if you thought it was a mission or not, and people still do. When we take people through, I've been a docent there for 25 years, we always mention this was not a mission, it's just always a hotel, and there's literally somebody on every tour that goes, oh, really? I thought it was a mission. Okay, well, if you want to see a mission, go about 50 miles west into San Gabriel. That's the closest one. Uh, here. But anyway, the Mission Inn uh, played uh, host to many, many, many people, very wealthy, famous, etc. Um, we built the arches out front there a little bit later because uh, Mr. Miller didn't think the building looked mission enough. 
So we put the Arched Arcade out there that's uh, still there in a, in a revamped format then. And of course, a grand hotel of this type, and not just the Mission Inn, but most of the grand hotels here in Southern California always had a courtyard. And you think about it, when you come out here to enjoy the climate, you can't do that indoors. You do that on, in a um, courtyard. So when you see a grand hotel here, they're going to have a courtyard. Think of the Huntington, think of the Del Coronado, and of course the Mission Inn. You think of a grand hotel in Boston, it's curb face to curb face because you can only enjoy the climate for about a week or two back there. <laughs> but here, when you do it for several months, you can sit outside there. So that's one of the aspects of these. Then, and you see the folks out here in their finery uh, sitting out here, including um, our uh, Teddy Roosevelt wannabe right here. Then uh, was quite quite a, a thing to dress up that way sometimes. Uh, the inn was very a, a very homey style of hotel. It was not a very fancy grand hotel with the marble floors and the, and the Roman columns and all that. Frank Miller did not believe in that. He wanted something to, uh, uh, he wanted people to be able to feel at home. And his slogan was, you cannot be both grand and comfortable. Uh, and so that was his trademark. And he'd have things for them to do in the, in the music room. Uh, because he'd like to get all the guests together, uh, so they'd have anything, uh, Sunday service, sing-alongs, recitals, pageants, what have you, uh, in here. Because of course when people are coming out here for several months at a time, they don't just sit. They want to do stuff. They want to be entertained. And that's what part of the, uh, the Grand Hotel experience was, no matter which one you went to. Yeah. But of course there were also excursions. And this is Huntington Drive going up Mount Rubido, uh, there, which is still there today. I don't know if you can see it. This back car has a rain cross right on that grill right there. That is definitely one of Frank Miller's uh, touring cars. He owned 80% of the automobiles in Riverside County in 1907. Uh, and they were all these massive Stearns automobiles here that took people uh, either up Mount Rubido or out Magnolia Avenue, Victoria Avenue, what have you, because it was kind of a big thing to be able to ride in an automobile back then. Our other big one in uh, Riverside was the Anchorage Park Inn. This was started by Ebenezer Brown, one of the founders of Riverside. Um, if you know Riverside, basically the interchange of 60 and 91, just to the southeast, that's where this was. Uh, here for many years until it burned in the early 30s. Funny how these things burned in the Depression and all that. So, And the canal went right through. This was a very popular type of postcard. And I should kind of diverge right now and say, you know, these postcards, are not just a photographic um, reminiscent of a place. These are also advertisements, okay? Because remember, this is one of your main forms of communication back then. And these things are being sent from here, out west, to back east. And this is a way that you get to people out here and entice them by sending them photographs then. Um, if you invest, and of course most of your investments are local at this time, so you're investing in a town, the way you make your investment grow is to get other people to come out and invest in that town too. No matter what town you're in, especially here in Southern California, we're all in competition with one another. Yeah. So you make postcards like this, oh my goodness, you know, we're just going out to the desert. We're never going to go to Riverside. Look, we've got a canal right here. That's our irrigation canal, right on the grounds of the Anchorage. Yeah. So it's a way of telling people. Because, you know, most of the people back east at this time thought pretty much everything west of the Rockies was just an arid desert. Uh, and so we had to be able to entice them out. Okay, Norco Corona area, our big one out here is the Norconian Resort. That building is still there. Uh, it's part of the Naval um, uh, Training uh, Academy there. But this was started in, uh, by Rex Clark when he started uh, drilling for a well and found uh, mineral water and decided he would start up a resort. Well, luckily for him, he opened it in February of 1929. And so, of course, it made almost no money throughout its about seven or eight year life until it was closed. But, it, uh, but it's a very, very nice build. It's in very good uh, shape for the most part. A lot of artwork in there. A lot of uh, celebrities are there. The 1932 swimming Olymp Olympic swimming tryouts were there, too. A lot of different things. Unfortunately, it's in pretty, uh, it's in fair shape now. We're trying to get it restored, but we don't know how that that's going to uh, do, but unfortunately, good old Rex Clark kind of lost his shirt on this one, but it's a beautiful building, and uh, there's been a show, one of Huel Hauser's shows we've done there, yep. uh, kind of give you an idea of the inside of it there. When we head down south in the Temescal Canyon, we have the Glen Ivy Hot Springs there. 
Um, probably our longest uh, hot springs resort in use in the county. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's probably about the longest used one. Uh, goes back at least to the 1860 or so as the Temescal Hot Springs. Then it became um, Temescal Hot Springs. And when uh, Doug W.G. Steers took it over, uh, there was another group that owned it, the teens. And then finally, in about 1938, a uh, Danish immigrant named Axel Springborg bought it and really kind of popularized it at this point. Uh, this is still there. You can still go to Glen Ivy Hot Springs. Um, a lot of the old buildings are actually still there. I was impressed. I had heard everything had been torn out and everything was new. And then the uh, current administrator of it gave me a tour and virtually everything's still there. Uh, and this is the main building. Then you typically have a main building that, off, that offered like a hotel type of uh, service. Then you'd have bathhouses and maybe cottages off to the side of it. This is the inside. Um, this is gonna make you archeologists kind of cringe, but you know, when you start excavating the buildings and you find the Indian artifacts, in this case, we just kind of put them into the, into the rock work in the chimney there. That, this is still there, by the way. You can still see the monos and matatis and some of the pottery and stuff like that. Uh, then, instead of excavating it, marking it, and all that, they just kind of tossed it aside and used it as part of the uh, brickwork. <laughs> then, um, and true to form, of course, when you have a springs, uh, you have to have a pool or a plunge, as they were known back then. Uh, this was something that was very, very uh, unique at the time. Uh, we didn't have a lot of these in the backyards, so you went to places like Glen Ivy or other hot springs places to go swimming. Uh, and this is a shot from probably the uh, early to mid 30s or so with it, and uh, swimming was a, a big deal at this time, but you could only do it in a formal location like this. And then of course, off to the back, we had Coldwater Canyon, um, because a lot of these resorts would offer you places to go hiking, get away from it, whatever you'd like to do, uh, get back into nature. Uh, you think, okay, south of Corona, where are you gonna get something forested like that? Sure enough, uh, when I took my tour of Glen Ivy, when you get back there, it's, it's almost like going to another world. Uh, in the back there, and there was water even at the um, height of summer uh, in there. So Coldwater Canyon is, is very unique in that situation. Um, you think, okay, Paris, what could possibly have been in Paris uh, <laughs> then? But there were actually a number of places in, in Paris, too. Uh, the Hotel Robertine there, uh, which was about 5th and C Street. This was a hotel that was run by two women. And they, uh, this was one of these recuperative type, uh, sanitarium type hotels. One of their more famous clients was Henry Harford. Henry Harford came out here as uh, what they used to call one lunger. He was, uh, had tuberculosis and they would call them one lungers because they'd probably come out here and just find a more comfortable place to die. But he, uh, would, he recuperated here at the Robertine and became a very influential member of uh, society in Paris, he became a uh, real estate agent, insurance man, and he bought property that he eventually donated to the county as the Hartford Springs Reserve, which is just to the uh, north of Paris. And he was a guest here at the Hotel Robertine uh, to recoup in the, uh, in the climate. And much the same story exists for the El Paracito. This is up in Paris Heights, which is uh, just west of the city of Paris. It's up in the hills now. Um, this actually started as the Hotel Belvedere, of all things, when they were developing the Paris Heights. Belvedere being an architectural term for a, basically a place with a grand view out into some place. That's from the Latin, grand, big view there. And then they, uh, they held a contest to see uh, if we could uh, rename it. They renamed it to the El Paracito, which I believe is the only hotel named for a school yearbook because that's what it came from. Uh, yeah, the Paris High School's yearbook is the El Paracito. They named it after that. How they came up with that, who knows, but that's the, uh, the only one. Uh, done. This is still there. It's a uh, Christian men's campus. It's like a rehab uh, facility there, but this was a uh, hotel for many years. Um, two, it had its um, kind of died in the depression though, so it became a boys' school after that. Uh, then, but the building's still there, and it looks pretty much like this uh, still. A lot of the uh, this pool is still here, for instance. Um, a lot of the brickwork is too. Uh, it's kind of caught in time there. Okay, heading down south, we get into Elsinore. Of course, Lake Elsinore was its own recreation area with the lake uh, there. Our, uh, one of the very few natural lakes within the county uh, there. A lot of boating, swimming, what have you. 
uh, on Elsinore, but Elsinore also had its bathhouses too, because it had hot springs, a lot of hot springs there too. And this is one of the original ones, the Elsinore bathhouse. This is still there. Uh, you can see it. Uh, it's in pretty much the same shape. For the last many years, it was an antique store. Uh, yeah, and there's some stuff in the back here too with it. But this was one of the uh, several bathhouses. There were just loads of these little mom and pop type bathhouses that weren't any more than maybe three or four rooms uh, or so within Elsinore. At the time, it was right along the railroad tracks. You can see that right here. Because if you were a photographer and did a 180, you'd be at the uh, train depot there in Elsinore. So it's right there. That's what you're going to see coming into Elsinore as you do train and go right there back then. Their other big one is the uh, Lakeview Inn up on the hills there. This was a, a more of a resort type of hotel uh, where you could come and stay for many, many uh, days, weeks, months, what have you. Uh, and it, of course, it had its own plunge. This was an indoor one. Then, I guess they thought uh, these things might freeze or so back then. <laughs> but uh, a lot of them were actually indoor. Then. Um, here's another one. This is the Bundy uh, Hotel. The Bundy family owned this, uh, Bundy Hot Springs. Uh, like I said, there are a number of just mom and pop ones that are fairly small. Didn't have any really large scale ones in Elsinore per se, but a lot of smaller ones. But you also have the lake here too. So. And then probably one of the larger ones is the Cleveland Country Club, which was a subscription club back in the 20s uh, when it opened. And it was uh, very famous for a number of years. It was actually there up until about 10 years ago when it burned and they had to tear it all out then, unfortunately. But it was a country club right there on the lake. The lake would just be right to the uh, right of the picture there. And of course, my title on the postcard on this was a Marietta Hot Springs, because this is one of the, also one of the earliest of the hot springs to be developed within, uh, within Riverside County. The um, facility is still there, but it's not used as a hot springs. It's a, uh, a Christian con conference center now. Uh, but, of course, you still are, can go along Marietta Hot Springs Road, et cetera. Um, interestingly enough, back in the 1860s, we started advertising this in San Diego. People would come up to take the waters. And for a while, you could actually uh, send your laundry up there. There was a laundry that would use that water to do your, your clothes. <laughs> so they put it on the train all the way up to Marietta Hot Springs and come back to San Diego and you'd have your laundry done there. So throughout the later 1800s, you know, it was kind of that way and, and a few people, but in 1904, uh, Fritz uh, Gunter uh, purchased it and really made the uh, Hot Springs Resort uh, that it was really known for, and that's where uh, this, this postcard comes from, uh, too. We had all kinds of different uh, facilities here and at other ones. This is a very typical camping type of uh, tent that you would see in a lot of these resorts, you'll see more of them too. These are just canvas sides on a wood frame, canvas top, wood bottom there. Again, your point is to be out in the climate, your point is to be uh, in the air taking it to recuperate. And so people would sleep like this. And of course, it was very popular uh, for many years to sleep outdoors uh, when the climate, when the you know, weather turned warmer in the spring and summer. Uh, then you had sleeping porches in, in uh, houses, even in hotels too. So. Uh, while we might think this is maybe kind of on the odd uh, side, this was very, very common uh, at this time, 1800s, teens, 20s, around then. And here's a whole row of them. These uh, appear to be about maybe tar paper shacks, uh, basically. But um, anyways, these are some of the different types of facilities that you'd have. These things didn't rent for too much uh, because uh, the interest here was in coming for the climate and the waters, not so much for the uh, for the luxurious facilities. There. Although you could get those too, uh, then if you wanted. Here's an overall view of the hot springs. That first one where the people were, that's that building right there. You got some of the wooden cottages here. Uh, of course, if you did the same view today, that all be houses uh, there in the freeway going through it, etc. But that was the uh, panoramic view here of Marietta. Yeah. You can just imagine how out of the way these places were at the time. I mean, when you were coming to these, some of these places, you were kind of going out in the sticks. Nowadays, we think of all the building and all the stuff that's around them, but uh, some of these, you might have thought you were going to fall off the end of the earth when you were getting there. 
Um, here's one of the mini springs that popped up um, there. And they, this is what people were really advertising was this spring water. Uh, that whether it was pure, whether it was mineralized, whether it was hot, whether it was cold. Um, when you look at the, uh, the tracks that they used to give out to people, there uh, a lot of times they had this huge table of just mineral contents of what was in the water that would make anybody but a chemist go blind just looking at it. But uh, that's what people looked at and uh, to see if they uh, had whatever you wanted or needed for your arthritis or your gout or what have you. And so people would come in, you see they're just dipping the, the uh, ladles in there to drink. Um, needless to say, this is before health regulations. <laughs> um, these ladles would have been just hanging here off the, off the side, maybe, um, and you just drink from it. Um, there are no disposable cups, no nothing like that. So and just imagine what the health department have to say about that today. Uh, then, but it didn't kill these people. Um, you know, that, that's the interesting part. You know, none of these, or most of these people did not die of that. <laughs> drinking that. So here's the sulfur water plunge. Again, not unlike that one late you in. Then so you could go in and uh, swim. There. But of course Murrieta was a much bigger facility, so it had a dance floor, it had a band. Uh, then for when you stayed here for a week or two or what have you, you could go dancing in the evening if you weren't uh, enjoying the waters or the climate or what have you. Then and they had uh, games croquet, tennis, all kinds of different things, just different activities, because these were basically touted as health resorts. Uh, and so you'd have to have all kinds of activities, whether it was hiking or games or whatever there. And of course, it had excursions, not unlike the Mission Inn there, where they would, uh, this is basically just a truck that they slap some seats on, <laughs> and they would take that around and show you all kinds of different things. There were archaeological uh, exhibits around Murrieta Hot Springs that they take you to, or just to go out and see the area. Uh, who knows, you might run into some real estate huckster who's trying to sell you land, too. That was very popular to do, needless to say. So anyways, this was kind of an all-in-one type of uh, experience that a lot of these places offered. And um, you know, we think, what would we do on, you know, on vacation nowadays? This was your vacation for a lot of times. Uh, if you got a week or two off, maybe you'd go to one of the hot springs resorts or so and just kind of relax. Yeah. Moving on up to Beaumont. Beaumont had one of the largest hotels in the entire county when it started. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. In fact, it was the it laid out. It was the largest city in the county when it was laid out. Not, not that they sold any of that land, but it was the largest one on the maps. Uh, there and this was the Hotel Beaumont originally, which later became the Hotel Edinburgh. And this was where the um, El Rancho is, basically at uh, Sixth and Beaumont Avenue. And this was their main hotel. This grew up in the 1880s, in the boom of the 1880s. The railroads had come through here. There are land speculators. Beaumont is laid out just hundreds of lots with this massive hotel. Every town had to have a hotel because you got to have some place for people who are going to purchase your land to stay. So this was it. Uh, it advertised 200 feet of sleeping porches uh, there. That's a massive amount. And um, it was there until about 1907 when it burned down. But by then, <laughs> Beaumont was in arrears, and um, it wasn't sold again until about 1912 or so. Uh, but Beaumont had that. And just north of it, on the uh, land that was originally owned by Isaac Smith, one of the very first settlers in the county, uh, is the Highland home. This was the Smith Ranch. He sold it to the Hirsch brothers, and they had a few springs on there, and so they developed what we know of as Highland Springs. And they pushed, uh, put this house on there. Give you an idea of the scale of the people right here. Okay, this is a pretty big building. Uh, and this is their main hotel building. Of course, the springs were off to the side of it there. Um, I believe this building was built in about 1888. Then later it was replaced by this one. Uh, then, which unfortunately burned a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken, back in the 80s or so. But for the most part, most of Highland Springs, the original resort is still there from the uh, teens, 20s, and 30s. And you can see how it offered, here's your mineral baths there, uh, here's the pool, uh, the pool and the, this building are still there, etc. You can get mud baths um, there, all kinds of different things are here at, uh, at Highland Springs. And of course, there's the pool, the shot of it. Uh, like I said, that building is still there, too. 
to a lot of different places that are coming up here. Um, this is kind of a cutesy little postcard of all the different things you can do there. The, you can see the ping pong and the volleyball and the massage and the chess and stuff like that. But uh, this was popular through, um, well, even through the 60s or so. It's still open. It's not a, it is a resort to a certain degree. It's not a hot springs resort, uh, but you can actually stay in some little cottages and uh, we're gonna be having the County History Symposium there in March too, so it has the rental facilities in it. Banning right next door was actually uh, touted for many years as a health city. And uh, Dr. John King, whose name appears down here, he had built this sanitarium on, um, uh, between 2nd and 3rd Street in Banning. He was a very influential physician, and he got on the bandwagon of town in uh, Banning uh, for its climate, basically that you got the dry desert air, but the cool mountain climate there. So if you didn't want to come to the desert and fry, but you didn't want to go someplace else and get cold, you could be in Banning, and you had kind of the best of both worlds uh, there. And at one point around 1920, somebody calculated there were about 20 sanitariums in Banning uh, there, which was its own interesting thing because by the time a lot of these people were coming out here with different ailments, there was a push here to not make Southern California basically the invalid capital of the world. Uh, then that, a lot of people were fearing that would happen. Uh, then, so there's another reason why they might be in Banning instead of closer to LA. Then, but for a while there, there was a siding put in at Cabazon, and a train or two were, were put on that siding because they were virtually full of TB patients. And instead of bringing them into the various towns, they'd leave them there, quarantine them so they could get better in the desert air, uh, and not be spreading the germs then. Because about this time, there's a huge backlash about all these people coming out, the one lungers I referred to earlier. Uh, and, but anyway, Dr. King's sanitarium was here for many years, as was the Southern Sierra Sanitarium uh, in Banning. <clears throat> this was only a few blocks away because Banning wasn't that big and they still had to house 20 sanitariums. Uh, there are various physicians and doctors, in quotes, would open these things and then have their, uh, uh, have their practices there. I'm just delving into one here now, uh, Dr. George Starr White, who uh, claims to have uh, diagnosed 50,000 50, uh, patients in some very short term. I, I think I figured he would have had to see almost 14 patients a day for 50 years to get to the calculation that he did. But he, um, oh, he was brought up on all kinds of charges and he was uh, really a character. He, had, he kind of looked like Mr. Clean with a with a goatee and, and like a Svengali type of person, but he had a, quite a bit of influence on people. He bought a place in, in Banning and opened it up called the Health Haven. Uh, and he's, uh, he's rather renowned today as a quack, uh, but it drew all kinds of, like I said, doctors and doctors uh, too, like this guy. But again, one of the 20 or so sanitariums that were in the, in the Banning area. And of course, we had to have, uh, Banning had to have its big hotel, and that was the San Gregonio Inn. Uh, which was actually originally the Hotel Banning, this portion right here. John Livesich bought it and then added these uh, cottages off to the side. It burned in 1930 and uh, was replaced by this building, a much more uh, Spanish-style building, which you may remember because it was there up until just a few years ago uh, when the city of Banning tore it down uh, then. But this was the inn and the cafe. There were rooms back here that you could stay in. Uh, there. Another one was the Hotel Banning, not to be confused with the other one, but this was uh, done by the Woodward family. Uh, it's still there. Actually, it's been renovated. And, uh, they've got apartment rentals in here. Now, uh, the building's still there. And again, it was touting the, uh, the uh, a real home for the traveler, new Hotel Banning. It was touting that dry desert air and cool mountain climate. Uh, too, so, and it uh, did apparently pretty well also. <coughs> Getting down into the San Jacinto Valley, we've got lots of these hot springs places here. Um, the three big ones, were, of course, were Eden Hot Springs. This is the northernmost one um, here. And in fact, uh, for a while, Eden was an actual uh, location on the map uh, there. You can see some of the remnants of it if you go in and don't mind people shooting. 
uh, but there are the, the buildings that were built beyond these, this, these are the early ones. Uh, this postcard is probably from about 1905, this started about 1904. Um, later on, there was a um, Spanish style building with a pool and the like. You can still see the remnants of that uh, there that was Eden Hot Springs uh, then, but that was uh, probably the lesser known of the three then. Uh, you can actually still see this little road with some of the foundations on it out there. But probably the main one, of course, is the San Jacinto Hot Springs, which um, started in the 1890s here. In fact, this building's about 1890, 91 here. Um, this was started by Hirsch, but it was soon uh, purchased by the Gilman brothers. Uh, the three Gilman brothers who had come out from Los Angeles. This is not to be confused with the Gilman Ranch, which is in Banning. Two totally different families here. Uh, but this is the Gilman brothers who came out and purchased it and then built it up. Not unlike Axel Springboard did with Glen Ivy Hot Springs, uh, the Gilman brothers made this into the big resort that it was. This is Gilman's uh, Hot Springs then. Yeah. Uh, this is about 1912, 1913 when they purchased it. Uh, family members still had it in 1978 when it was sold to the Church of Scientology. And this is that large Scientology uh, uh, place that's there on the uh, 74, 79, excuse me. But of course, Gilman, uh, they had their springs here. This is the, almost that exact same shot of Marietta Hot Springs. People gathered around with their communal ladles by the spring. Uh, they're drinking the water. Uh, very typical of this time here. Uh, but Gilman had a cafeteria, it had uh, really kind of A1 facilities here. So you'll like our food and service. And of course, they had the tennis courts in the buildings, this is the bathhouse back here, and some of the cottages. I don't know if a lot of these things still exist. Um, I've not been all that courageous to go there. Uh, then to see, but I, from what I understand, there are a number of things from the old Gilman Springs that are still there. And of course, you can take a little excursion about a half mile away to Massacre Canyon and see the falls. Uh, if you haven't been here, this is a great little hike in about maybe, oh, I don't know, half mile, three quarters of a mile to see these falls here at Massacre Canyon. If you can get up this, which is only about 12 or 15 feet, there's another set of double falls up here. Uh, too. And when the springs are running up on the Potrero, south of Beaumont, then the water comes down there and you can see these uh, waterfalls. They're just beautiful. Uh, and for, like I said, probably about a half to three quarter mile hike, it's on very even uh, ground there. It's not like you're scrambling up rocks and stuff like that. But anyway, there are lots of excursions would go up there to see them and, and other places too. Because again, people coming out for several days or weeks then. To the south of that, um, then is Saboba Hot Springs. Uh, this is Colonel Ritchie's um, uh, development. He bought, a, of course, the former uh, hot springs, which really weren't all that big, and then he converted it into Saboba Hot Springs. This is the main bathhouse here. Um, then, this, of course, was burned many years ago. Uh, then, but here's the Ramada, where you could be outside, of course, enjoying the, uh, the climate. Then. And in the 20s, when uh, Richie sold out to John Althouse, John Althouse built an Indian village. And you can still see a lot of these, actually. I've uh, loved to venture into them sometime. Uh, but these were all little Indian-styled uh, cottages that you could rent. And they were all named for various Indian groups. There was the Shasta, the Yuma, and the Apache, and, and things like that. But when the San Jacinto Valley really went into Indian culture because of Ramona, uh, there, he kind of glommed on to that and built the Indian village here. And of course, up on the hill, this overlooks the entire San Jacinto Valley. Uh, then, so you get kind of one of those great uh, views uh, of the entire valley while you're taking in that uh, that uh, modified or made-up culture. There, there's one of them up close. Uh, two of the great pictures that we have in uh, in the collection of the San Jacinto Museum of people at these. But the main uh, place in San Jacinto was the Farmer House. Uh, the Farmer family owned this back in the 1880s uh, through the early 1900s when they sold it to the Vosburgs. And this is the Hotel Vosburg. The, the building is still there, but it's been so heavily redone uh, as to almost not be the original. Uh, then but the Hotel Vosburg was the main uh, hotel in uh, San Jacinto for many years here. 
And similarly in Hemet, the Hotel Hemet was, actually started as the Hotel Mayberry. Edward Mayberry was one of the founders of, of Hemet, so he named the hotel after himself, but that soon uh, got changed to the Hotel Hemet. Uh, and this was a very Victorian looking building, right at the southeast corner of uh, Florida and State, there. It burned in about 1917 and was replaced about 10 years later by the Hotel Alessandro. This going with that whole Indian and Ramona theme, because of course, who's the hero of Ramona, but Alessandro. And so they, they do it in a very Indian style, Pueblo style um, architecture, and then name it Hotel Alessandro, and note that it's in romantic Ramona land. <laughs> so right there by the, by, or rather close to the uh, Ramona Bowl. So if you're coming off of that, uh, then you can stay in the Hotel Alessandro, of course. And we move up to the San Jacinto Mountains here. Once we got a good road uh, up in the San Jacinto Mountains, a uh, number of people uh, came up here, up to the San Jacinto Mountains, escaping the heat in the summer. So that became more of a summer resort as opposed to most of the rest of these became more winter resorts here. Uh, this is an early shot of the Hemet Idlewild Road, because that was the main one. Um, one of the big ones up there, at least for a very, very few years, was the Idlewild Sanitarium. This was built by Dr. Walter Lindley. He was one of the founding members of the USC Med School. Uh, but he was one of these passionate boosters of just about anything anybody would pay him to do. Uh, he would go around and just tout the beauty and the climate of just about any place that, again, would offer him money. He's got tracks on Indio, he's got tracks on LA, he's got tracks on everything. And he um, and some investors built this in 1903. Well, they didn't figure on it being cold up there, I guess because um, he didn't have a lot of success healing people. And in fact, the newspaper mentioned that he would bring his patients up in wagons and down in boxes. And so, needless to say, the sanitarium closed about two years later, and then for some reason, it burned the next year. Um, then I, not saying anything here, but I'm sure maybe Dr. Lindley's uh, you know, pipe lighter had something to do with that. But anyway, on that ground later on, the um, Idlewild Inn was um, built. It was originally known as the Bungalow, but then the Idlewild uh, Inn here was purchased, or was uh, constructed. And this became one of the larger uh, resort hotels up there in the San Jacinto Mountains. Uh, yeah. And of course, they had other resorts. Uh, they're mainly camping resorts. This is Idlewild Pines. Of course, you see the, the cabins, not unlike what you saw there at Marietta Hot Springs. Um, there, these types of things. But of course, these would be open in the summer. Uh, then they probably open around May or June through about September, October. Uh, then, of course, the big excursion there was to go to the top of San Jacinto Peak. And of course, by then, at uh, this time, you're going by horse. And you're probably going for two or three days. Then, uh, Keen Camp was another one. In fact, Keen Camp became sort of the uh, uh, a place named just south of Idlewild there for a long time. Keen Camp would later kind of morph into Mountain Center today, but this was the um, development of John and Mary Keen, who owned the hotel down in uh, uh, Val Vista. Again, they had that one and this one too. So Keen Camp was there, and again, it would be open in the summers too. Keen Camp eventually kind of morphed into Talkwitz Lodge there. And if you know the area, you may know the Living Free Animal Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. That's right off of the 74, right at the split there. Yep. That's this property here. Mm -hmm. In fact, you go to the uh, Living Free Animal Sanctuary, a lot of these buildings are still there mm -hmm. from the Atopolis Lodge and Keen Cam era. And of course, the big thing to do uh, for excursion-wise, besides going to the San Jacinto Peak, was to go see the engineering marvel that was the Hemet Dam. And this was the, the damming of the Hemet Valley to create the lake, which then offered irrigation water to Hemet down below. And, and uh, that was a popular excursion for many, as it still is. Um, yeah. And now we get into Coachella Valley, um, too. Of course, uh, one of the first big ones being uh, Palm Springs. Here's the Palm Canyon Drive there. Uh, this had numerous different places. Uh, this is where people would come to be seen, too. This is where your Hollywood set would come out to uh, go to the various hotels or what have you in Palm Springs to escape to the desert. Of course, what really started it was the springs there at uh, the Agua Caliente, 
which is what the original name of it is when you go way, way back. This is the bathhouse. This is basically where that spa, hotel, and, and casino is. And that's it uh, in the earliest days. It got a little bigger. Yeah, it got a little bigger um, then. But that, that's the original portion of it. Then um, all kinds of different uh, uh, things in travel journals and the like that would tell of people diving in here and being shot up by the action of the of the water out there. Uh, a couple of people said it would be almost impossible to drown in there because you couldn't stay under long enough. Uh, and it would be, be kind of interesting to do that. Of course, they're long gone uh, then. Uh, the next big one, of course, was the Desert Inn. This was Nellie Kaufman's um, uh, baby, if you will. She came out and did, uh, did this. Starting as a health resort, it became more of a uh, vacation type of resort uh, later on, and this went, went on for many, many years uh, there. Of course, it was torn down years ago, too, but the Desert Inn was really a, a big place in Palm Springs, uh, sort of, again, the place to see and be seen, if you will, in the <coughs> dining room. Uh, then, uh, interesting how you say something with open air and it's a room, but uh, then, of course, the El Mirador, uh, then this was the uh, another big one here with its own huge pool. Then once one kind of got going, a whole bunch of others went uh, came in. A lot of a lot of movie stars went in with developers and, and purchased land, made these things. Uh, then this is the view from this tower, that tower up there. That's the view from it. Nice. Yeah, looking out into the mountains down below. Um, and uh, be hard to recreate that now, but. Uh, this would be the view, and of course, view of 360 degrees all around the desert uh, there, so you could see all this, but this was the place to come out uh, to. Uh, desert Hot Springs, of course. Uh, and, of course, uh, Lawrence Coffee, you know, started doing the subdivisions in the 30s, opened this bathhouse in 1941, uh, then it kept it going for many, many years. Uh, and, could never figure out why uh, he never used his real name, but I found it in Lawrence. Uh, not that that's you know embarrassing or anything like that. Usually when people go by just simply their initials, they've got some really weird name. It's just Lawrence. So, but anyway, the Desert Hot Springs uh, uh, bathhouse there, and of course uh, to the south is the La Quinta Hotel. This is uh, William uh, Morgan's. There, this was developed as a place in the Cove, La Quinta Cove, and this catered to the um, Hollywood set too, uh, and the wealthy. But this is where you went to to go if you wanted to just get away and not be seen. A lot of people would come out to Palm Springs so they could still be seen. You go to La Quinta so you weren't seen. And this had the individual casitas. It's still there, very much still there. Although now it's it's mainly a golf resort uh, nowadays, and you can still see a lot of the these early casitas, as they called them. Uh, yeah, but this was kind of hidden in that cove there, and uh, was a great getaway place. Uh oh, come on, there we go. And of course, then Indio had its own. It had the Hotel Indio uh, here. This was at uh, Smur and Miles. Yeah, and unfortunately, it burned a few years ago, uh, and it's now just an open uh, plot of land. But um, the Hotel Indio, right on the main highway, and of course, Indio is going to be about the first town you come into if you're coming off the desert. So this was a big place to come and stay. Uh, not necessarily the resort that people like Lindley uh, thought of, but um, definitely had its series of hotels like this one uh, too. And people would stay there for a number of times too, especially if they really wanted the heat. Because uh, some people, that's what they really wanted to try to get, uh, get uh, better. Yeah. Of course, the Salton Sea. Uh, came in, of its own really more in the 40s and 50s then, but of course they had a lot of development around there that um, has really kind of uh, died off, unfortunately. But uh, the Salt Sea region had an awful lot of uh, things going for it, a lot of resort, a lot of uh, uh, boating, skiing, stuff like that, lots of pictures of uh, launching boats and, and things like that. Just again, out in the desert, someplace to be while you're out there. So that about does it. Wow. So, anyway, I, I, I know I went kind of quickly, but uh, you know that's about a two-hour talk, if not. Uh huh.
you mentioned a lot of places that had hot springs. Um, obviously, in Desert Hot Springs, we're still very actively using our hot springs mineral resorts. Mm -hmm. Are there which which of the areas in Riverside County are still actively using their hot springs? Um, outside the Coachella Valley, pretty much Glen Ivy. Really? Yes. Um, in the 30s, um, you had two things going on. First off, the farmers were pumping more and more water out of the ground. And also with the uh, Metropolitan Water District's aqueduct that oh. came through and went under Mount San Jacinto in the 30s, they broke through a lot of those springs, that oh. subterranean water, and it went into the pipe there and drained from these hot springs. So you had kind of a two-fold thing. So a lot of these springs uh, places dried up. You can still see some of them, but they're not enough to be commercially viable. Like when I was there at Eaton Springs, there was a little place where you could still get in down a couple of steps and you'd see some sulfur water bubbling up and the like, but you know, it was a very little bit. It was probably, I don't know, two foot square or something oh. like that. A lot of these places just dried up oh. there. So pretty much Glen Ivy is about the only one really yeah. I know they told us at Highland they don't have any uh, anymore, um, and of course Gilman and Saboba aren't, so. Wow. Uh, Audrey? Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the sulfur, and I was just curious how many of the, the early springs, which I found fascinating, I had no idea that there were so many in the early days, um, how many were sulfur? Well, I've, I've never done any count on them, but um, there would be very, very different ones just very close together. So like in Elsinore, for instance, they talk of having sulfur ones and non-sulfur ones very, very uh, close to one another. Same thing, I believe, in Yeoman. Um, now, oftentimes they would use that sulfur water even in the city. Um, my dad, who was a pharmacist, would work down in Elsinore, and he said, you know, in the 50s, they, they'd draw Cokes and they'd smell like sulfur because mm. they're using that water. People just loved it. Uh, he couldn't understand why, but people just loved it. Uh, so it, it really just depended on where you were. And uh, again, not unlike here, where you've got a cold and a hot spring just within a very short distance, uh, you can have the, the clear water, sulfur water, or any other mineral water ones just very close to one another. Yeah. And they would tap into and use those in different ways, too. It's not to say that these resorts were literally right on top of these things. They would typically maybe put a well in and pipe into a building or something like that. But they'd be very, very close. So, uh -huh. You mentioned Massacre Canyon. Is there a story behind that name? There is a legend behind that name, uh, which I guess is a story. But um, the legend goes that well, basically, Saboba was an Indian village called Eva. And the story goes that the uh, Indians were out harvesting a, uh, a chia plant there for their food. And the rain had not been that great, so it was not all that plentiful. And the Temecula Indians were coming up and taking some of that, and they got into a battle. And the Temecula Indians pushed them back into the canyon, and there really is no escape from that canyon. Uh, there, the walls are probably at about a, you know probably 70 degree angle, and so getting up them is very tough. When you get back to that um, uh, falls, there you're basically in a rock room, and if you can't climb up that rock there very easily, especially if somebody's shooting at you, um, then you're you're done for. But there's only one way in and out of that, and so the story goes that the the men of Eva were massacred and then the rest of the village had to move on there. So, again, that's the legend, so. Hey, any other questions, or, okay, I guess I'll hand it back to John. Thank you, Steve. That was fantastic, and those old, uh, all from old postcards and your history, we appreciate it ever so much.